Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. Today I have with me Abhijit Doran Ayer Mitra. Abhijit, welcome to P Guru's channel. Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram. And Abhijit, uh, a lot of things have been happening in the last few days vis-a-vis -vis opportunities for manufacturing stuff in India uh, that used to not be there because India was usually having a price disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis China with uh, Indian government banning so many apps of China, 59 as a matter of fact. Also, they are taking China out of several other segments. Is there a way you can perhaps tell our viewers your thoughts on what are all the segments that India can easily supplant China to take pole position such that India can A, consume what it manufactures and B, start exporting it. After all, India enjoys an excellent export market for many of its products in sub-Saharan Africa. Right. See, the issue here has always been, so flat out answer is, I don't think India can substitute given current reality. Uh, but why is that? See, for so many years, we've kept on saying the Chinese can't speak English, they can't software code, they can't do this, they can't do that. And India rules the Silicon Valley, our software is the best. Yet today you find that all these very, very good popular apps are Chinese apps. Where is your local browser like UC browser that got banned? Where is your local social media? Imagine America comes up with uh, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook and all of that. YouTube. China comes up with TikTok. Tell me, where is your counter to that? Tell me these 59 apps. What is the Indian app? that you see as a counter to that. And what amazes me is nobody is asking that question. What happened to the so-called software prowess where the software superpower? I, you, you know, I've come on this program for what, three, four years consistently now. And I keep telling you that we're basically software coolies. We're not software factory ka malik in that sense. Where are you seeing? Tell me, Shri, do you know of a single Indian app? That is capturing the world. Well, there is one that Infosys tried with some amount of success. It's called Finacle. Although I have my doubts about its efficacy. That is one product that came out of uh, Infosys. However, you have bigger powerhouses like TCS, Wipro, Cognizant. I haven't seen any products from them. They seem to be perfectly happy assisting or being able to provide the manpower for other companies. I think they always have this conflict problem that if they develop product that they could be effectively competing against some of their customers. Um, yes, it is possible. Why can't you create a shell company, a separate corporate entity and create your own product? At a Chinese wall kind of a separation so that... At a Chinese can... wall, why don't they do that? So this is what I keep telling you. We are cyber coolies. We are not cyber innovators. The cyber innovators go off to America. We run Silicon Valley. But though those aren't, stop looking at them as American Indians. They are Americans. They did what Dr. Bose did in the 1960s. He couldn't set up his speaker factory in Kolkata. So he ran off to America and he then started manufacturing some of the best speakers in the world, or at least the most, I don't like Bose speakers, but then he started manufacturing some of the most recognizable speakers in the world, right? This is the problem consistently with India. And it doesn't matter if it's a Congress government, a third front government or a BJP government. We are not a business friendly government. You know, everybody says, you know, we run Silicon Valley, but they don't think why you can't recreate Silicon Valley out here. There is not one Indian company that pioneers, uh, you know, path breaking products. The few that do exist are niche. Not, not many people have heard of them. They go under the radar and they mostly provide subsystems that get absorbed into a larger hole in America. Number one. Number two, you know, we keep laboring under this belief that if you provide infrastructure, everything else will grow. And this is what happened with roads. This is the same mistake China is making with one road, one belt, one road, or what's now called B, excuse me, BRI. 
and I'll tell you what the problem with it is. This is a Western cut and paste model. When all your regulatory mechanisms, your land, your, what are, all your uh, factors, uh, you know, entrepreneurship, land, labor, all of this are in order. Infrastructure, adding infrastructure, public infrastructure, then gives a huge boost. In countries like India, in South Asia in general, where nothing is in order, your regulatory mechanism is in shambles. Your dispute resolution mechanism is the biggest joke in a 12,000 kilometer radius. Your uh, uh, labor laws are so scary that nobody wants to touch it with a barge pole. Your land is the most convoluted, corrupt business in existence anywhere on the face of this earth. Uh, your, your land uh, dealings make sub-Saharan lawless, sub-Saharan African countries look like first world countries by comparison. What do you have to go on? Let me give you a simple example, Delhi Airport. You know, the company that built Delhi Airport, they didn't make most of their profit building the airport. They got their money squatting on that piece of land now called Aero City next to the airport, keeping it fallow for 10 years, allowing it to appreciate, artificially appreciate in price, then constructing things out there and auctioning it off. All right. This is what they do in every construction project. You don't actually make most of your money. You make a lot of money even on the construction. But mostly what you make your money on is the land grab that happens around it and then selling it off. You have such an artificial contrived land market. This isn't a free capitalist supply demand model of land or building operating out here. So tell me, what do you have going for you? R the rule of law is a joke in China for a different set of reasons. The rule of law is a joke in India for a totally different set of reasons. There, what happens is the government just overrides um, laws as and when it sees fit. Here, what happens is the laws simply don't work. They're not enforced. They're a joke. It's, it's sort of law is optional kind of uh, uh, door, uh, uh, door uh, entry sign. So in such circumstances, you can't have a business environment that promulgates more growth. There is literally no place. All right. There is no place that we can go in and replace China. If you remember 56 in the wake of COVID, 56 companies announced that they were pulling out of China. The vast majority of them have gone to Vietnam and about six or seven of them have already signed the entry agreements. Not one of those companies has finalized their entry agreement with India. Why is Vietnam able to move so quickly and finalize their agreements in a month or two months and we're still sitting twiddling our thumbs? I don't know. Okay, this is becoming a chronic problem out here. I don't think anybody's interested in solving it. We can keep having these fantasies and delusions, you know, India next superpower, India uh, Vishwaguru, India Vasudeva Kutumbakam and all of that. The reality is you're not a very important country. You're not going very far. You're not going to go very far. You, you're really the only uh, importance you have is the size of your population and nothing else. All right. And that's about it. Well, um, this is a younger demographic that has a dividend. Unfortunately, it seems as if the country is not able to harvest that dividend because the same set of people go abroad and seem to do extremely well. One in three startups in the Silicon Valley is founded by an Indian American. That's a stunning fact. And, and, and many of the startups are uh, going on to become fairly successful. So there is something, the entrepreneurship is there. So, like you said, perhaps the environment creation, the way to make sure that all these hurdles placed in the way can be removed. See, Abhijit, one thing you have to remember, software companies don't have that many needs. You can write software sitting in the comfort of your room. As long as the guy who's architecting the software knows how to pull all the Lego blocks from various developers, put it Look, together, she, run she, it, she, and, and okay. release all of that is fine. But tell me if he can do it sitting from his room, why does he have to go off to America to do it? For one thing, power. It used to be a problem. Second thing, connectivity. These things are being solved now. I mean, I can realistically okay, tell you. Solved for a very long time. We haven't had power cuts in Delhi for the last six, seven, eight years. Long power cuts. 
Okay. So what is new? No, it takes time for the mindset to grow, right? No, I mean, no, no. I have to... completely. These are all excuses that people make. I don't uh, see this as being a valid point at all. And I'll tell you why. It is about when you have 1.3 billion people, okay, five to six million people, statistically speaking, doesn't matter how bad the education is, how bad the circumstances are, every year, five to six million people will be ultra bright, ultra brilliant, ambitious. Uh, ambitious in that will be a smaller subset, say about one to two million. And they will automatically move to greener pastures where there's a better lifestyle where the ecosystem and the environment is more conducive to their own uh, creative abilities. And invariably, it turns out that pasture is Silicon Valley. They move out there. Okay. The entrepreneurial spirit of the Indian people has been crushed over the last 70 years. What you have is you have people trying to make ends meet. You have people trying very hard to create businesses in spite of government apathy, in spite of government persecution, in spite of day-to-day -day government harassment. But that's about it. You're not able to actually cohesively and comprehensively bring together your national uh, uh, you know, uh, abilities in a comprehensive form. Now, you look at the kids, there, there is a fundamental, what you called the demographic dividend, I call it demographic nightmare. You are meant to be spending to get to a China level. Okay, I'm not talking about an American level of production. I'm talking about a China level of production. You need to spend about $1,000 per kid per year on their primary education and $10,000 per kid on their secondary, uh, on their trade or, uh, uh, you know, uh, business ed uh, work education. The total education bill of that comes to something like four to five hundred billion dollars a year. You spend eight billion dollars a year in public spread out over about what? One hundred and fifty six million uh, kids uh, per year per class, uh, 13 million per class per standard one, standard two uh, per year. And the creamy layer spend another equivalent amount, $8 billion on just say about 1 million very rich kids, not even very rich, even middle class kids, 8 billion gets spent on their education abroad and giving them a quality education. Your differential there, you know, I keep hearing this demographic dividend and you know, if, if it went such a sad, pathetic joke, I'd be laughing. It's a really painful joke. Now, people really need to stop talking about this rubbish. You're spending $16 billion where you need to be spending $500 billion. There is a fundamental investment problem. You can't drive a Rolls Royce. You can't buy a Rolls Royce when you've only got five lakhs in your pocket. At best, you can buy an auto rickshaw, right? These days, even an auto rickshaw costs five lakhs. Amazingly, it costs more than your entry level Maruti. So th there is, there are hard limits to what you can do. How are you going to solve this problem? How are you going to turn the so-called demographic dividend into an actual dividend? I see it actually turning into a serious demographic crisis. You're going to see increased violence. You're going to see high levels of societal violence. What has happened with COVID with the three month shutdown is our economy has been set back at least about 10 to 15 years. I don't know how you're going to cope with that for the first time in India's modern history okay by 2011 your agricultural the your agricultural workforce had come down to 21 percent your real rural population had come down to about 35 to 45 percent uh, maximum about 45 percent in the last six to eight years we have seen that reverse completely today you're back to about 55 to 60 percent of your population becoming rural again you're seeing a deindustrialization happen without ever industrializing properly. You're seeing the number of doles that go out on the MN Rega rise exponentially. There is massive hidden unemployment that we don't see. You know, I, I, I am not seeing I am not seeing anything positive happen for us in a very long time now. And you know, what's amazing is, I think this is why we don't go in for an Australian style. You know, Australia has a ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Their job is throughout the year, 
they keep compiling information. The government gets free access to it. Any business entering Australia has to pay them for very, very defined, very, very specific access. So it's brilliant statistical collection. We don't do that in India. Why? Because the government doesn't even want to address the problem. So what are you basing your policies on? I feel this way. How is that any different from a social justice warrior? It should be. So, so you know, the, the uh, governance in India is Omar Ilhan's idea of political activism. Ilhan Omar is the government of India in that sense. They both base their policies and their thoughts and whatever on feelings, not on facts. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to, you know, indulge these delusional opinions that, you know, India is going to substitute for someone or something or, uh, you know, where the next big power that's coming and blah, 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 blah. Unfortunately, you're like a pot that's perpetually on simmer, like in a slow cooker, you can never go up to a boil. It'll cook, it'll cook the meat. In a pressure cooker, you'll cook the meat in 45 minutes. In a slow cooker, it takes about 8 to 16 hours to cook the meat. In India's case, it's one of those malfunctioning slow cookers that will take about 48 hours to cook the meat. And by that time, the meat would have already gotten rotten. <laughs> nice. <laughs> right for there. Um, look, the, the challenge in front of Modi today is one of preserving the lives of people. And let's say that they have done a decent job of it and they'll have to go back to the drawing board to do the uh, next thing, which is to bring it up to the next level. Remember that America has closed its doors for H1s up until the end of this year. And I'm reasonably sure that the next year also is not going to be any better. So India will have to figure out they may have to do some of the jobs that used to be done by people coming over to the US to do it in India. So there will be a certain amount of trickle down jobs that might happen. And uh, that's just the IT part. But there is a whole bunch of other things. If you are not going to get pins, needles, Ganapati statue, you know, uh, clay Ganapatis and fireworks from there, those things will have to be done in India. Those are like things that we gave up 15 years ago. Those things will get revived. They will not. They will not. And I'll tell you why. Because Indian manufacturing, all the thing is geared towards high tech, high tech, high tech. OK, people don't want to manufacture clay products and things like that anymore. Let me give you a simple example. We used to have a thriving ceramics industry in this country. All right. Today, there is no ceramic production left in India worth its name. It's all shifted to guess who, not China to Bangladesh, okay, to Bangladesh, who now produces some of the best ceramics in the world, even though they've got the same quality of clay as say West Bengal does. And Tata Ceramics imports all their ceramics from Bangladesh. Okay, uh, they've overtaken you, Bangladesh has overtaken you on textiles. You can't even manufacture yeah. low grade things like ceramics and textiles. What are you going to manufacture? And you want to manufacture LCA and next uh, advanced medium combat aircraft and all of that. So th this is the problem. What I fear is we're getting into a serious policy delusion problem. We don't understand what the inputs are. We don't understand cause and effect. There is no accountability. Every man gets a dream. And they go by their dream rather than going by any facts or any uh, tangibles and things like that. It is not happening. Low end production is not happening out here because remember, low end production also requires the sorting out of the regulatory mechanisms and things like that. In fact, more so because low end production is what you call a sweat house. Let's be, uh, uh, let's not, uh, you know, make it politically correct. It it is what it is. They are sweat houses that require intense labor engagement with underpaying, not underpaying the labor, but paying them what is fair by the market, which according to Indian policy is underpaying them. Tell me, how is it sustainable? With your labor laws right now, they won't last a single day without having a strike. It's not possible. 
so what these three governments have done these three bjp governments have done up uh, madhya pradesh or is it chatisgarh and uh, gujarat which is suspend all labor laws it's a very good first step the issue is if you suspend labor laws for 3 years everybody investor is going to think fine 3 years isn't enough to break even what happens after those 3 years okay so you have a fundamental problem out here that we, we can keep dreaming uh we can keep going by the best case scenario and then keep getting disappointed but i'd much rather we dealt with the worst case scenario and overcompensated rather than getting disappointed unfortunately what i'm seeing is everybody's just being kumbaya see, holding hands and singing kumbaya uh because a policy solution to everything is mandir mein jao jay jagdish hare gao panch das bar bhajan kirtan karo sab theek ho jayega bhajan kirtan is not a substitute for good policy yes indeed that is correct and uh, much food for thought here for the government for those who are watching this video but i think there are many suggestions I mean, at least a few come to my mind. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not going to do that today because I have to think it through a little bit more to make it more realistic. Uh, for one thing, India needs to do what Israel does, which is to try and vision what the next generation technology is going to be, and try to train their workforce towards that right from their high school point of word. Actually, point one, of second, one second, just to interject there, they did not. envision what the next generation technology was going to be one of the reasons netanyahu is going to be the longest serving prime minister of israel was that he stopped because you know israel was fundamentally a socialist country its foundational idea itself is socialist one of the things he did was he just stopped government interference in business and he allowed individual businesses to grow we should not make this mistake that china is making which is see an end point of technology and tailor everything to it okay you basically just back off and you let the people do what they want you let the market go where it wants you do not get into this five year planning mode of envisioning what the end state is and pushing your resources there israel never did that what is really uh, i disagree with you uh, in the 80s hang on, hang on hang on hang on hang on le 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 see they gave them a fantastic grounding they gave them fantastic intersectionality of technology with practicality and they literally just threw them out there okay there is a way western markets work which is that all kinds of technology are invested in because you invest in science for the sake of science today for example with this phone the uh, push uh, the sort of finger gestures is quantum physics and this is the same uh, 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 thing that einstein dismissed when niels bohr brought it up with him and yet it was invested in china the biggest mistake they are making is they are designating these eight parallels of critical technology where everybody needs to go which actually stymies education so you can have a vision of where your human resource is going to go and plan to that but you can't have a vision of where technology is going to go and plan to that because that's a very very dangerous form of constricting technology in a sense um what i was trying to say was in the 80s and 90s in the previous millennium israel had invested big time into digital signal processing which was a fundamental concept at that point which people were still warming up to but that fundamental thing gave rise to so many things video mpeg decoding encryption uh, you name it and a lot of these things us actually gives silicon valley a run for its money so much so that some of the most advanced chips from intel cpu family are actually designed in israel today so yeah the, remember what the background to that was digital signal processing came about because israel was a pioneer in ga gallium arsenide uh, chips it was developed purely for military purposes initially which came about remember you can't focus a national objective with a military objective what happened with digital signal processing was it was the creation of lots of things it was the creation of electronic jamming electronic warfare waveforms and it was for radar waveforms israel is today one of the world leaders in radar technology we buy most of our radars from israel 
be it on planes, be it on ground and things like that. That was a very, very specific national project, which then cross pollinated because they have this genius program. They bring young kids fresh out of school into their electronic warfare cells, into their industrial uh, espionage cells and things like that and cross pollinate it, which is very, very different from setting sort of, you know, condensing your whole nation into a narrow goal. It's it's sort of think of it this way. It's the way America has prioritized the to, uh, making gallium arsenide chips cheap. Twenty years back, gallium arsenide chips cost something like uh, they were ridiculous. It was something like a five million dollars for every uh, uh, little this thing. Today, it's brought down to something like twenty thousand dollars. Right. So so there is specifying certain things, but you can't state the end. You can't put in the end state of technology out there. That is one of the most dangerous things you do with technology. It's fine for a company to do. It's fine for a military to do and then collate people around that. But for a country to do that, the way China is doing it is some of the most dangerous things you can do. You do not do that. Well, um, very interesting conversation here, uh, Abhijit. And, and just for an aside, I studied under a professor who did the first gallium arsenic, uh, arsenic, uh, arsenide uh, GAAS transistor, GAAS on a, a wafer and so on and so forth. I used to study and uh, I did my master's under him. And uh, I know a lot about that stuff, interesting stuff. This was in the 80s when it was still a research project, uh, something that people were still warming up to. But you're right, it's a faster compound compared to silicon. And it's got its own applications. I think we are probably shining the torch on a few things that the government needs to do. Make it easy for even private businesses to thrive. And who else, who better than somebody from Gujarat, which is the place where most entre entrepreneurship starts. And I'm not giving you a chance to revert me on this one. I mean, we have to leave this on a positive note, not just I, keep... Gujarat is the most business friendly they're the most entrepreneurial. The one reason Gujarat is my favorite state is because nobody there wants to join government. Yes. They are the most individually liberated people. They do not want to become parasites who live off other people. They want to create things with their own two hands, take pride in their own hard work. And, you know, create employment for other people. They want other people to depend on them. They don't want to depend on other people. I think Gujarat is the shining light of capitalism in this country, which is what I find so devastating that a supposedly business friendly government from Gujarat is so business unfriendly. Well, uh, they're trying hard. I can tell you that. I mean, I've done a series of uh, videos you don't where Trying. Trying doesn't win you. Uh, ultimately, people only remember who won the You have to get the results. I agree. I agree. I think there are some things that we kind of don't see eye to eye on some of the topic, but I think we're going to have a very healthy discussion on this again in a few weeks time. And thank you very much, Abhijit, for sharing your thoughts. As always, a pleasure having you on our channel. Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram.